Okay. All right. Well, James, welcome to the Pioneering Today podcast. Hello, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Well, I've been really excited for us to do this episode because I actually found out about you and your product and what you were doing. Oh my goodness. It's probably been almost a year ago now. And we've had this scheduled, but with both of our schedules, I feel like it's taken us forever to get here. So I'm really excited that you're here um, and that get, we, we get to talk about that. So I'm just going to jump us right into the topic um, because what I love is this crossover where with homesteaders, we're very much focused on using all of the parts of the animal, um, you know, making sure that everything gets used, that things don't go to waste, being a good steward of things, and also the health aspect. And so I feel like where your product and company has come in um, is embodying all of those things, uh, but then creating something for those who don't have the ability to raise their own animals or to get it maybe direct from a farmer to get all of these. Um, but you're putting what so much of the industry doesn't use um, and, and putting those together in a way that is benefit of health, but is also really delicious. So mm. let's start talking about, because sometimes people aren't even familiar um, in this day and age with the term offal. So what exactly is organ meat and what is the benefit of adding organ meats to the diet? Yeah. So, so offal or awful, I've heard it spoken in a few different ways. Um, they think that that name comes from, uh, it references when you go to slaughter the animal and you cut, make the slice from, you know, basically the neck down, uh, that those are the parts that fall off. So they think that that's where the name come, comes from. But it's, uh, it's an ironic name, of course, because most people think, it, you know, organ meats taste awful. So, right. <laughs> Which so is why -F -F I say awful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. O F F A L, everyone. That's how you spell it. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, it's got quite the uh, misunderstanding, I think, because I think a lot of times people just think of organ meats as liver and heart and kidney. And it's particularly kind of becoming very vogue, you know, particularly uh, in, in some of the animal based diets right now where people are like, oh, I eat ribeye and then I have liver. And I'm always like, well, but that's just like two parts of the animal. <laughs> like, what about the other 99% of the animal? You know what I mean? It's like, like, we just we're just so sometimes stuck in this very, like, familiar place, like where we, we just want things that are familiar. And you probably see this when people get meat shares, right? They get like a quarter cow and they're like, you know, all the ground meat and the ribeyes and the steaks kind of go quickly. And then like the, the cuts that they're unfamiliar with just kind of sit in their freezer for a really long time. But organ meat or offal refers to every part of the animal except for the muscle and the bone. And to your point, and this is so upsetting to me, um, but I was just recently at a slaughterhouse uh, in Wyoming and my experience at this slaughterhouse is mm, this is very familiar. This is how it is at most slaughterhouses. I think there's an exception to the rule, but this is the majority of slaughterhouses are similar to what I experienced. And I asked the question, I said, so how much of this animal are you utilizing? And they said about 50%. And I said, okay, so what's happening to the other 50%? And they said, honestly, it's getting trashed. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> like what? Like, like we talk all the time about, you know, planet focused and take care of our planet. And, and there's even like misinformation out there about how animals are not good for our planet. And I'm just like, no, no, no. What's, what's not good is when you take any industry and you only utilize 50% of the resource from that, in, that industry, that's not good. 100%. And we're, we're not honoring the animal and we're not utilizing the some of the most nutritious parts of the animal. And yet we're then turning around and spending our money on supplements and pharmaceuticals and all these different things that are supplying potentially the nutrients that we're not getting from our diet. Yeah. You know, the only one that I personally know of 
is white oak pastures that that has their own you know that and they use it's it's really incredible they 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 sell the actual awful products um that you can actually get from them um i mean and they even use the hides like they use every part of it um which is a really incredible example and i'm hoping that that more and more people will begin to adopt that model, even just as awareness as have made it like, look, you know, at what you, what all you can do with this and people start to demand it. I really hope that it becomes more of a norm than it is now, because right now they're the only one that I can say I know is yeah, doing this. And you know? they truly are one of the few. I, I think there's a few different issues. So one is it's a very antiquated industry, you know, um, the slaughterhouses there, yeah. they've been run a very specific way for so long. And so change in any antiquated industry is really hard. It's, it just, it, it takes, it, and it, we're seeing this also in agriculture, right? Agriculture mm -hmm. is a very antiquated industry as well. And so people don't want to change. They, they just want to kind of do the same all. It, but we are finding more and more people that are willing, you're getting younger people in there and who are willing to, to try things differently, maybe, uh, try regenerative farming versus conventional farming, things like that. So um, I think change is on the horizon, but it's going to be slower than what we technically need it to be, because I think we need things to start moving faster than they are, particularly when you talk to, you know, environmentalists or people in the agricultural business. It's like we're, we're potentially past a tipping point, you know, so that doesn't mean we're it's doom or gloom, but it just means we, we got to start making real changes. And um, fortunately, I was talking to the person who owned the slaughterhouse in Wyoming, and, and they are looking to build another slaughterhouse and make it 100 percent usable. Like so everything that's produced there will be 100 percent usable. But one of the things that has to happen is that we have to get not only the, the people who own the processing plants, so the processors, uh, connected with the ranchers and everyone kind of on the same page there. But on the other side of that coin, we also need the kind of entrepreneurs or the businesses like myself yeah. connected to those processors because a lot of the processors, they, they'll do it, but they just don't have a connecting point. They don't have like, well, okay, well, who's going to buy it? What mm -hmm. is it going to be used for? So they don't have that solution because that's not their business. But if I can just bring in more, you know, like-minded entrepreneurs who are using, let's say, the fat, who are using the hides, who are using different parts of that animal and turning that into money for the processors, there's no reason why anyone won't make change because money makes you know, makes the world go round. Let's, let's, let's be honest, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is the driver of change, which is why we hear so much like vote with your dollars, you know, because if there is a want and a need, someone will come in to meet that and fill it, but they have to see that there's that want and need and that there's the market for that. And that can be created by people who want change. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. So back though to organ meats, because this is something that, that I hear a lot of in particular to the liver. And I've done, so, I've done some different podcasts on that, but I, I think that in the context of this one, it's good that we touch on that because I hear a lot of people be like, oh gosh, well, you shouldn't eat the liver because that's where all the toxins in the animal are stored. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what that is actually a falsehood. So like spoiler there, um, not necessarily true, but let's kind of talk about the liver, um, and some of, some of the health benefits of the different organ meats themselves. Yeah. Well, and just to answer kind of why that's that kind of uh, concept is not correct. If I may, like, um, yeah. I think it's fascinating because I, because I think that just, if anything, the question, it's a great question, but it's a question that really shows the disconnect that we have of how our own bodies work and how food affects our health. Because if you think about it, if our own liver and kidneys, because that's really the detoxification organs that we're talking about. I mean, skin is also technically one too, but 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 really those are the ones that are processing toxins. And if those worked the way people thought, which is when we talk like, oh, well, the organs are the where the toxins are stored, that's what people are thinking, then you would basically be insinuating that the organs are a filter that can't get clean so imagine in your sink if you're trying to put something you know get rid of food down your sink or something that that 
that con that the um, the the sink disposal part it just gets clogged and there's nothing there. There's no switch to kind of clean it or there's nothing to strain any bits out. And if our bodies work like that, we would be dead very quickly, right? If you think about how many toxins we are processing on a daily basis. And so the body, if, if you really think about it, the body is an incredibly beautiful, resilient, miraculous thing, this entity. And so what it's really ultimately what the kidney and the, the liver are is they're more like um, they're they're more of a filter than a sponge, because I think that's what people are imagining, that they're more like sponge like and it just kind of comes in and it can't get out. But what they're doing is they they are processing those toxins and making them water soluble. That is their job. And when they become water soluble, they can then leave your body. They leave your body through poop, through pee, through your sweat. And that's why we need to make sure our elimination pathways are working really well. Uh, anyone that's hugely overweight that loses weight too quickly and is and doesn't have good elimination pathways, they can make themselves very sick, for example. And the reason why they do is because where the toxins, if you if their toxins are not eliminated out of the body, where they get stored is not in the actual organs, it gets stored in the fat. So that's why someone who's overweight who loses weight too quickly can get very sick. And so it's just, a, I think it's like on one level, it's like, okay, just remember our bodies are really resilient and that's why we can feed them horrible food for so long and they still exist and still live. Um, but they also do have a breaking point but the organs have a job to do and they do their job very well. And how they do that is they convert, get the toxins out of your body and they move those toxins to your fat. So yes, if you get like fatty liver, if you have the fat built up around your liver, that's where the toxins are going to go in that, in, in that fat. Um, but when we think about organs in general, what we want to think about is, the nutrient density. And so they have a job to do. And if you think about it, they, it, what's ironic is the, 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 the nutrients that science tells us we need to create life so that we find in prenatals, for example, there's very specific vitamins and nutrients that in our, that are in a prenatal that they say, Oh no, it has to have folate. It has to have magnesium. It has to have iron, it has to have potassium. It has to have all these, these different vitamins from vitamin B, vitamin A, C, D, E, and even K. And what's fascinating is if you look at organ meats, not I, not just liver, but I'm talking like spleen, uh, kidney, heart, uh, pancreas, all, all the different parts, different glands, they have everything that's in a prenatal and they have it in mother nature's form which is really, really key because when we isolate vitamins or minerals, like, like let's just even talk about vitamin C, for example, like vitamin C has changed over the last 40, 50 years. They used to just isolate the vitamin C from the, from the orange or whatever they were getting it from. Right. But then they later learned, Oh wait, that's not, you can't absorb that as well. So then they were adding like rose hips and they were adding other vitamins or other parts of that orange to the vitamin isolate and because because they were starting to realize oh wait we cannot actually assimilate or absorb this vitamin without its cofactors or without its with uh, supporting ones but what's beautiful is when it comes from mother nature it's exactly in its absorbable state so the iron it has the magnesium the the, the the iron is heme iron it's the most absorbable form of iron it's just it's so beautiful and it's right there for our taking if we just ate it yeah and i'm so glad you brought that up because so much of what we see in our modern food system and even really our modern medical system is either synthetic forms or to your point when they've been isolated and pulled out and so i mean there's a reason that that you'll hear this thrown around that uh you know you're making really expensive urine <laughs> because or uh, you know, by going to the bathroom, poop, by taking a lot of just supplements that are, vi you know, in vitamin form, like capsule form and all of this, uh, because your body can't actually absorb and use them, or it's a very minimal amount uh, that's actually usable. And so you're kind of just flushing this stuff down the toilet. Uh, it's not beneficial to your body because of all of these different reasons. And 
when they're isolating, like you're losing a lot of different parts. I mean, even just within our flower, you see commercial flower and it's been stripped and that's why it says enriched with, but they're only putting back those key nutrients. You're, you're literally missing out on hundreds, if not thousands of all of the of different nutrients that are in the actual wheat berry and flower when you grind whole fresh flour and eat it where you've not removed the germ and all of those things. So by using the organ, sorry, I get super excited. <laughs> like by using all of the organ meat, I mean, you're really getting an incredible amount of nutrition you will never get from supplement form. Yeah. Well, and you can, you know, when you get it synthetically, it's like your body, as you said, you're, you're either getting too much. So your body needs to get rid of it. Um, or you're getting, you're getting it in forms that your body can't absorb it. So it still gets rid of it to your point. But I think what that speaks to is also this very kind of American concept, which is like, go big or go home. And that's a concept we get a lot with people email us around with pluck. They're always like, well, the organ meats are in a seasoning. So how much am I really getting? You know, is it, is it enough to really, you know, affect me? And I'm just like, well, here's the thing. Like, think about, I mean, break down any part of the human experience, any part of our body that does well in extremities. Like we don't, we don't actually process, if we get too much of something, our body rejects it, wants to get rid of it, right? That's basically what we're saying. And so for my money, like I actually want things in microdosing. I want things in small amount, but here's the difference is I don't want them once a month. I want them daily. I want them in small amounts daily because then I know A, I'm absorbing it. And B, the more I do it, the more often I do it, just like we brush our teeth daily, multiple times daily, right? If we only did it once a week, we would not see the effects. But if we do it daily, multiple times, we then have clean teeth, right? Or we have a clean uh, mouth, you know, our, the biology of the mouth is cleaner. But the, and the same thing happens when we're eating, you know, these microdosing, these organ meats regularly we're getting those micro the, we're getting the micro dosing of the micronutrients just like when you salt your food but you're getting even more and it's basically accumulation it's like you're getting a little bit often cumulative effect and we see that in the positive when you're doing things like organ meats but we also see that in the negative when we talk about things like glyphosate like glyphosate was something that was introduced uh, back in the 50s, I think the late 50s. And it was in Roundup. It was Monsanto that put it out. And it was sold to the US as, oh, this is microdosing. It will not affect human health. And look at where, we're, where we are now. It's like it's in our breast milk. It's in our water. It's in our air. It's in our soil. It's in our food. Like we cannot get rid of it. I mean, pretty much every single person on this planet has got glyphosate in their body. Yeah. And so that is and it's potentially severely hurting our health. How 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 severely is depending on the person, but it's it's negatively affecting our health. And that is microdosing, accumulation or or microdosing regular use and then accumulation which is for the negative. So I'm just trying to turn it on its head and saying like okay, let's just do this with organ meats because right now we're not getting any. I mean, for the most part, most people are getting nothing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people that, um, like I said, they don't even know what the, the term is. Um, I've never had it. Or I think probably a lot of people have memories of tasting liver and being like, oh, I don't like that. And so right. then they've never, they've never, uh, you know, tried any of the other organ meats or they, they have this association that everything's going to taste like that, or I don't like that. Um, so Let's kind of talk within the organ meats because we've listed out several, but like I said, it, it seems most people have a connotation with liver when you mention organ meats or offal. But um, are there any specific organ meats that are best for nutrition? Um, and then let's talk about actually eating them and consumption of them, which we have here where it's that the, the microdosing, which is of good benefit versus the bad example that we had. Yeah. So, so, well, first of all, so we mentioned the liver, kidney, heart. That's the more common organs. So some of the others are uh, spleen, lungs, testicles, ovaries, brain. You hear of, you, you probably have heard of Rocky Mountain oysters. That's yeah. uh, those are testicles, which I love that name for them. I think that's hilarious. Uh, thymus and pancreas. Um, you also have the bone marrow. You have tongue, lips, ears, skin, and tail. Which, if you remember back in the '90s, that was people learned. Oh, that's what's made uh, out of hot dogs or hot dogs are made out of that. Um, 
there's blood, there's the stomach lining, which is called tripe. Uh, and that is typically found in uh, some different soups abroad. You, you have the feet, uh, the chicken feet, for example, make amazing uh, bone broth. They, they add a gelatin, gelatin to the bone broth, which is unparalleled. And then you have intestines, which back in the in the South, back in the day, that's chitlins. Uh, that's what was um, used for that. And then those are showing up in world cuisine. You know, in, in Mexico, they use the beef stomach in menudo. That's a dish there. In Scotland, they have haggis, which is uh, sheep and calf heart, liver, lungs mixed with suet, which is the kidney fat. Uh, they also add oatmeal and seasonings. And it's usually, if it's authentic, it's boiled in in the bag made from uh, the animal stomach. So it's boiled in the animal stomach. Okay. Um, blood sausage or blood pudding is used uh, in the UK or, or sorry, in Ireland. And in the UK, you see stuff like steak and kitty pie. I remember when I first went to the UK, I, I was working at a pub and they said, oh, you want a steak and kidney pie? And I'm like, awesome. And I thought it was kidney beans. And I was like, oh, that's not, that's not kidney beans. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea, but you know, you learn quickly. Uh, and then there's pate. That's another form of how people get it. And as I mentioned, the chitlins. And when we talk about like, well, what are you getting? Well, I what I love to talk about is this concept of like supports like. So we were talking about how the uh, liver and kidney, for example, are detoxification organs. They have a job to do, right? So those organs have really specific nutrients in them for them to do their job. So the concept of like supports like is if I eat that organ from, let's say a cow, then I am getting those nutrients and they are going to support that same organ in me. And what's fascinating is when you start to break down the nutrition of some of these organs. So like liver is high in vitamin A, which is also known as retinol. Uh, well, vitamin A is important for reproductive health. It's important for eyesight, immune systems, um, supports your skin health, right? And it also has a multitude of uh, like bioavailable vitamins that combat numerous diseases, including heart disease and Alzheimer's. So that's a good thing to have in your diet, but it doesn't stop there. Kidneys, they're rich in B12 and selenium, and they also have the, high, the iron but they also contain a nice balance of copper and zinc. And that uh, is basically there. The, so the kidneys are, they're giving you that support that's gonna support your own kidney. But what I love about uh, this kind of like supports like is when we look at the heart, because the heart has something called coenzyme Q10. And if you know any kind of heart supplements or even pharmaceuticals, a lot of times they will have CoQ10 in it. And it's basically, a, it's found in cow heart. Like it's literally there. It protects against cardiovascular disease, infertility, and even mitochondrial dysfunction. So isn't it fascinating that the heart is supporting cardiovascular disease? And then of course it goes from there, like pancreas is something that we include in pluck. And the pancreas is known for containing natural enzymes like lipase and protease and it's what's fascinating is that you know a lot of us have issues digesting or absorb absorbing foods mm -hmm. and so some people will be given like a, an enzyme like a pineapple enzyme well guess what if yes. you just ate pancreas that's a natural enzyme you wouldn't have to take that pineapple enzyme and that's the beauty of that. Like, that's why in Pluck, we're, we're adding five organs. We're doing liver, heart, kidney, spleen, pancreas, because every one of those is providing something different. And so that and so that like supports like is supporting all those parts in you. So our, our thought is, is that if you're sprinkling something on there on your food that has pancreas in it, then that's going to support the digestion of that process. And what's even more beautiful is it's a mother nature made product. There's nothing synthetic about it. So it's yeah. completely natural. So uh, to me, it's a win-win. Yeah. Well, and I and I love because this is using parts of the animal that right now, which we're all hoping to see a change, um, it is throwaway stuff that for yeah. the most part. That, that's a lot of, of garbage or it's just not being used. And really in, in America, I mean, we are sadly lacking a lot, a lot of nutrients. So I love that this is becoming a solution. Um so let's talk a little bit, James, about getting your family, because part, of, I don't even think I got into this part um, in the beginning, but, but you, 
started as a private chef. And so I love how that comes into your journey here, because one of the things is we all, most people do know that, or have heard that organ meats are good for them, but it's kind of one of those things like you can know something's good for you, but if it doesn't taste good, you're still not going to eat it very often unless you're extremely disciplined, but like getting your kids to eat it, or if you have picky eater, it's like good luck, right? Like I can tell my kids something good for them all day long. And if it doesn't taste good, they're just not going to eat it. So I want to talk a little bit about getting our family to eat organ meats and then about pluck and how that can help be part of the solution. Yeah, I am. So I am a pick eater. Uh, historically, I, I was like, one of those kids who when we would go out to get fast food, which was off, I, I'm a kid of the 70s. So most of us growing up then fast food was like, cool. And I remember like, back then, it was like, if you were in high school, it's like, if you worked at fast food, like, oh, you had the best job, you know. Um, so very different than today's day and age but but i would go to fast food and i wouldn't eat a hamburger as it was so they would always have i would always just get it plain so i had they'd have to make it from scratch and i was kind of like paleo before paleo existed like i would pull the hamburger out of the bun and then toss the bun so i made it look like i was eating the whole hamburger but i was just eating the meat so um all your paleo eaters can thank me later no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, as someone who, who grew up being very picky, I really, as I became a chef, cause I became a chef in my thirties, I've been a professional chef for over 20 years. And I really came to the, to, to that career thinking about food differently, I think, than, than most people. I was very aware that texture is, plays a huge role in what the choices we make. And then, of course, as you mentioned, flavor as well. But ultimately, what I set out to do as a chef was like, well, how do I support people in changing their diets for the better? So what, what I ultimately look at is, OK, we're human and we gravitate towards comfort foods. So, the, you know, and we, we learned this when when the. Um, pandemic happened where did everyone what happened well alcohol sales basically everything that was addictive uh comfort foods they everything kind of increased around that stuff and so for my money it's like okay we we're not going to fight human nature human nature we're always going to kind of go back to those comfort foods but how can i make those comfort foods healthier for you so i focus on the texture so let's just say if you're someone who really likes mashed potatoes well, then how about if the potato is too starchy, which we, and it converts into our our blood as sugar very quickly. And, and when you're trying to really master your health, you really don't want to have huge spikes in your blood sugar. So you're, the idea of like low glycemic or low carb meals is very attractive towards someone trying to lose weight. And so then I'm looking for foods that are not going to convert so quickly. So they're not so such simple starches. So I might choose something like celeriac or cauliflower or some other kind of root vegetable, um, sweet potato, butternut squash, anything, anything that's a little bit more resistant starchy. And it, but then I make t make sure that it fits that same texture. So if you like mashed potatoes, then I do it the same way. I, I take that cauliflower, I, I boil it to soften it, and then I mix it with butter, you know, like really good fat. So butter and some flavors, and I make it into a mash. If you like crispy things, then I would take it and I would roast it instead. You know, you toss it in some fat, you roast it. Brussels sprouts are a great example that a lot of people have grown up historically with boiled Brussels sprouts, and they think they're gross. But if if I take that same Brussels sprout, cut it up and toss it in some fat and then roast it, it's a completely different experience. It's more like chips. Mm -hmm. So whenever I worked with a client back in the day, I would always focus on, okay, what is the textures that you gravitate towards when life is hard? You know, what are the, what are the comfort foods and textures you gravitate towards the flavors? Um, something I also think is really important around picky eating is color. Uh, we, we tend to not, like when we're cooking for ourselves or, or, or our family, we tend to not focus on presentation, for example, but it's hugely important. Like how close is the food to each? Is it all just mashed together? It's just like a casserole, right? Is it things like that? Now, when it comes to 
food, picky eating, I am a huge believer in that families should not be cooking multiple meals for each person. Like I don't believe in actually catering to the picky eating in that way. I just, I just believe in catering to it where you're, you're, you're meeting someone where they are, but then you're making sure that the dinner or the meal works for everyone. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I really find like when you, when you do that, you can truly kind of like turn anyone that's picky into a more adventurous eater. But one of the things that a lot of people undervalue is the palate. So the palate, when we think about the palate, we're really talking about four flavors. We're talking about salty, sweet, bitter, and sour. There's a fifth one called umami that was discovered in the nineties in Japan. And there's even a sixth one they believe is basically like rancid food. They think that that's its own unique flavor as well. When something's turned or gone bad, which I think you can, you we can attest to that. Like if you've ever smelled really bad sour milk, it's not. It's more than just sour. It's like something's. It's unique, you know. Yeah, I would agree. Actually, I'm laughing because last night my husband opened a package of shrimp, and I mean shrimp has got. I mean seafood has a very strong smell already, but you can tell. It was beyond yeah. just smelling like shrimp. I'm like, that one's gone bad. Like, get that out of the house. I swear I could smell it for like, you know, an hour later. So, yeah, I completely agree. Like, that a, yeah, it's a unique turn. smell. You know, it's a it unique is. taste. Yeah. And, it, and if you think about it, if you go back to this idea of like, well, just like I was saying, the organs are designed for your survival, right? They, they're designed to work. Well, these flavors are communication pathways like these flavors and smells. And so it makes sense that it would have a unique smell because you don't want to eat things that are off because yeah. they'll make you sick. So it's yeah. for our survival. But one of the powers of understanding these flavors is then you can support someone who's picky. So someone who's picky is really skewed towards specific flavors. And in the US, we're skewed towards salty and sweet. And that's really it. And so yeah. once you identify that, I look at flavor and, and food as color or, or even as music, right? So let's just equate it to music. If salty sweet is like, I don't know, pop music, then that means your kid is just kind of addicted to pop music. So how do we introduce them to other flavors? Well, we got to start to bring in these new, these other flavors, but you just don't want to bombast them with these 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 sounds like so in a sense it's like if they're hooked on pop then you start incorporating a little jazz a little classical or something like that into their lives and you would do the same with their palate so so you would treat it just like a dog for example like if i have a dog and i'm transferring you know transitioning them to a new food you don't go all in with the new food if you do they'll probably get sick or have diarrhea because their their constitutions are more sensitive than that so what you have to do is do like 95% of the old food, 5% of the new food. And then you, you, you keep doing that until eventually the new food is the 95% and the old food is the 5%. And so I would do those with the flavors. So if I'm, let's say I have a kid who's uh, mostly likes those dino chicken bites, but they eat it with, let's say ketchup. Okay. That's most kids are potentially like that. So what I would do is I would add a little bit of sauerkraut juice, which is sour mm -hmm. to the ketchup, just a little bit, not so much that they're like, they go to eat it and they're like, this is not my normal ketchup. Like you don't want that response at first, but you want just a very subtle, just add a little bit of that kraut juice, which is the sour to their ketchup, mix it in. They don't know it. And then they keep eating it. And then every time they go to eat it, you keep doing that. And maybe if they're you're making um, grains or something like that, instead of just doing the grains and water, you do it in some bone broth, yeah. right? You do it in things that are having dip, not only different flavors, but also different nutrients. And you slowly start to bring these things in. And we, we get this comment of people who just do that with pluck. Like, so all they're doing is they're seizing the same food their kid normally eats, with pluck. That's the only difference in the meal. And because pluck is primarily umami because of the organ meats, mm -hmm. their kids' palates start to change and they start to kind of like open up a little bit. And once you change the palate, now you have an adventurous kid. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I look like 
there is so much here that we could go into just on on the the cooking and the textures and flavor layering um because unfortunately you're right i mean so much of american cuisine really is that sweet and salty you know we we don't typically cook with organ meats um let alone other flavor profiles like that or even learning the differences in textures and and how to how to present that or even really even cooking from scratch that, that's something that a lot of people are returning back to now like i need to learn how to actually cook so i'm really excited because you are going to be at the 2025 modern homesteading conference um super excited to have you there and i know you're going to be actually doing some different demos and things um to help people be able to prepare the stuff if they're homesteaders and raising but even if not like how how to cook what i think i really enjoy is a lot of times I feel like people take health food and flavor and they put them on two different things instead of realizing you can have food that is healthy, nutritious, nutrient dense, and it can taste amazing. Um, that That is something that you can have. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So I get really excited about teaching people how to bring those together um, in a way that makes sense for their family and with their time and you know all of those different things. So um Anyhow, so yeah, if you're coming to Modern Homesteading Conference for 2025, which I hope you guys are, um, you're going to be there. And um, I'm really excited for for the things you're going to be bringing. But um, let's talk a little bit about Plex. So I will have a link, guys. If you are watching this on YouTube, we'll have it in the video description. If you're listening to this the old-fashioned way, um, then we'll have it at... melissaknorris.com forward slash 444, just the numerical 444, because this is episode number 444. Um, and we'll have links where you can go and check out um, Pluck. Um, highly recommend getting some of that. And you can start with that now using it as, as a seasoning base. So do you want to tell us maybe, because um, I know there's a couple different variations, like what if someone is brand new to this, which one of your products do you recommend folks getting started with? Yeah, our our most popular is probably the original, which is our yellow bag. Um, and Pluck, basically all of them have the five organs. They're coming from 100% grass-fed beef, uh, liver, heart, kidney, spleen, and pancreas. And then we're mixing them, uh, three of them actually, of our four products, we're mixing three of them with red mineral salt, spices, and herbs. And I would say the yellow bag, which is original, is our most popular second is our zesty garlic, which is um, has no nightshades or seeds for anyone that's sensitive to those. And then our third is one that's kind of like a taco mix, but it's called spicy mild. We, we added the mild because we we realized a lot of people are assuming it was really strong. But the, the, the kind of concept behind Pluck is that I have two daughters. One is 12 and one is eight now. But when I created this, they were a lot younger. Um, I think I started formulating the concept about six years ago, but we we fully launched about four years. So it was a two year process of just kind of testing and sampling. But it really it stems from me as a father wanting to get the most nutrient dense foods into my daughter's diets and my own, really, uh, but get them as easily and deliciously as possible, because to your point, I have learned in my 20 years that to make health a lifestyle, you have to hit both of those. You can't just hit one or the other. It's got to be both delicious and easy because the reality is we're human and we cannot fight our human nature. Our human nature, as I mentioned earlier, we default to comfort foods. We default to foods, uh, to habits that are easy. Um, we, we don't, we, while we talk about change a lot, most of us fight it. You know, it's sad to me, but the reality is that most people will not change their diet unless they themselves get sick or someone they love gets sick. Yeah. Like that's the truth. So what we have to do is somehow inspire um, our desires and our, 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 our kind of openness towards trying something new that is healthy. And I think that the way to do that is to not have it require a new habit and that's what that's one of the beautiful things about pluck is it's it's, it's a seasoning you literally treat it no differently than you would salt and pepper um if we we say if you can salt it you can pluck it so it's not requiring a new habit but yet you are getting those nutrients from those organs 
you're getting them regularly because every time you season something, you put them on. And something as I, I know you're a, a parent as well, but something I think all of us parents can identify with is that we all have days where they go sideways and we have to eat out. And the reality is, is if you're eating out, it's impossible to be healthy because there's a whole, that's a whole other talk, but there's, you know, health, the, the uh, restaurant business is, does not exist for our health. It exists because someone believes in the flavors they're promoting, but then they also are trying to make uh, profit and you cannot profit if you're just focusing on quality. Um, you'll, you'll probably, your doors will shut down before you can, because those restaurants, those kind of like farm to table restaurants are extremely expensive and they're expensive because quality is expensive. Yeah. And so when we're looking for cheaper meals, you, you just, you can't expect it to be healthy. It's not, that's not the focus. So eating out uh, as a parent, it, you, you, there's a part of me that feels bad when I eat out. If, if we do, I'm just like, oh, I'm not giving my, my kid that nutrition that they need. And yeah, I get it. It's nice to do, you know, every blue moon, but many of us get stuck in doing it multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. Like, let's be honest. Like some of, some of us just, we don't meal plan, we get busy, life happens, and we're suddenly find ourselves ordering pizza or getting that takeout. And I love the fact that when that happens, and it does happen every now and then, that I can sprinkle pluck on that meal, whether it's pizza, whether it's any kind of takeout, doesn't matter. And I just feel a little bit better because I know I'm giving my child Mother Nature's multivitamin. I know that. And I know that they love it and it makes the meal taste better. So to me as a father, it's, it's, yes, it's as a chef, it's a win because I'm trying to get nutrient dense organ meats into people. But as a father, it's a win too, because I, I mean, all I want is my kids to be healthy and happy. I think that's what we all want. And, um, and so I'm just grateful that this product now exists because you know, yes, we had capsules before this, but it's hard to get capsules into a kid and it's not very oh, yeah. tasty. It's no. it's really not that delicious. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I've been doing a lot of traveling lately. I was sharing right before we started recording, I'd been working on some projects and doing a lot of travel and my goodness with tra for any of you who travel for work or, or have to travel very much, like I can tell that, I mean, like you know what? Um, the first meal or two, you're like, okay, but man, man, like by the end of when I'm traveling, even as much as I'm trying to seek and find good choices, you know, on the menu or, or whatnot, oh, like I can just tell the difference of eating out, even if it's just for a couple of days in a row. Oh my goodness! So I love that this. Plus, it's lightweight, um, so it's something that you can even take with you uh, travel-wise um, and add to. Uh, because like you said, circumstances in life just happens. And so this is a way that you can just use it straight across the board and at least cut, try to redeem some of those meals that you know aren't really the best. So thank you so much for coming on, James. I'm really excited just to to have more options for people um, available. So thanks for coming on and, and thanks for creating such a great product. Well, thank you. And a huge congratulations to episode 444. I mean, that's a huge accomplishment there. Thank, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I look forward to seeing you again in June, if not before. So thanks so much. Take care.